Hello everyone, welcome and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we are going to discuss Murder in the Cathedral, which was written by our favorite poet T.S. Eliot. We all remember T.S. Eliot from M.E.G. 1, don't we? So this is a very serious drama. It has, um, it is like a verse drama and it has all the verse as in like B-E-R-S-E, not W-O-R-S. It is about Thomas Beckett, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is a man of deep faith and commitment to the church. So what happens is uh, he has kind of uh, a fight, not fight, but he's not in good terms with the king. And so uh, he sends uh, people to kill him and then he sacrifices himself. Uh, so these, he sacrifices himself by choice rather than giving him to the king. And this is why this play is very important. Now something which I would uh, say is uh, T.S. Eliot we already know from his famous uh, poem The Wasteland. It is the poem, you can say. It is a very a huge poem and we have all read it in MEG1. So you can see uh, T.S. Eliot and his reference. Uh, so when you hear uh, Thomas Beckett, the Archbishop of Canterbury, does this ring a bell to you when you hear Canterbury? This reminds you of Canterbury Tale, doesn't it? Right? So yes, this is the same Archbishop and uh, this is the same Canterbury where all the pilgrims from our Canterbury Tales are going to visit. So, uh, T.S. Eliot actually just wrote a play on what must have happened in uh, 1170 in Canterbury when the Archbishop sacrificed himself. But this play was actually published in 1935. So, Eliot was writing about uh, what must have happened hundreds and hundreds of years before. And you remember uh, Chaucer was actually a 14th century, 15th century uh, poet. So, he was also, when they were visiting the Canterbury uh, place uh, when they were visiting Canterbury uh, those things must have happened like about 300 years ago right um, so it's just I mean it's not really um, important but I just like when things tie up together it's like uh, the people who designed the syllabus for Igno Energy they kind of put some thought into it and they end up bringing everything together just like how most of the plays it happens that everyone comes together in the end Ah uh, yeah. So let's just start with the basic information of the play. Then I will talk about the characters in like about uh, a line or two, and then we will talk about uh, the play. And I will also give you some quotes. This play is very important if you think about from the exam perspective. It has come mostly most of the exams. Uh, one at least one question would come, and also there is a lot of questions about the four tempters and uh, also about the chorus of women and their representation. And also there are more questions which I have put in my blog, I'll leave a link for that where you can check all the questions which have come from this play before so you can prepare accordingly. So um, also one more thing that this play is uh, very serious, it is also very religious so it is not as fun or as comical as the other plays so you have to put a bit more effort and attention when you are reading this play or when even when you are listening to this uh, audio or if you're looking at this video. So, uh, Murder in Cathedral is a verse drama written by T.S. Eliot. It was first performed in 1935. The play is based on the events surrounding the assassination of Thomas Beckett, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in 1170. It explores themes of martyrdom, political power, and spiritual struggle. We have a couple of characters. I will talk about them. So, the first one is Thomas Beckett, as I have mentioned. He's a man of deep faith and commitment to the church. Then second, we have chorus of women. So this is not one woman, but it's a group of women. They kind of give the background a song or the chorus. This represents the people of Canterbury and expresses their collective emotions and thoughts. Then we have the four tempters. As I've mentioned, a lot of questions come from this. They are the figures who tempt Beckett to compromise with the king of for personal gain. Then we have the sentries. This is the priest who warned Beckett of the impending danger. Then we have the four knights. These knights were sent by the king to assassinate Beckett. And finally we have Archbishop of York. He condemns the murder and predicts its consequences. So this whole play is about, uh, is exactly five acts and then there are uh, multiple scenes in the play. Um, let's start with uh, the act one. The play opens with a chorus of women from Canterbury expressing their anxiety and fear about the arrival of Archbishop Thomas Beckett who has been in exile for seven years. They anticipate a significant event. 
एग्जाइल जैसे कि राम जी को भेजा गया था वनवास पे दैट्स एग्जैक्टली व्हाट इज एग्जाइल व्हिच मींस दैट ही हैज बीन लिविंग अवे फ्रॉम द पीपल अवे फ्रॉम द सिटी अवे फ्रॉम द विलेज एंड ही वाज इन एग्जाइल फॉर अबाउट सेवन इयर्स ही वाज बैनिश्ड फ्रॉम कमिंग बैक टू सिटी then we see thomas becket finally after his exile he's returning to canterbury cathedral and he's welcomed by the chorus of women he explains the dangers he faced during his exile and his intention to protect the church from political interference right because at that time church was more powerful and the politics you can say they were trying to interfere more in the church and he did not want that because he was a man of deep faith with this our act 1 finishes and we will start with act 2 act 2 we see that becket's inner conflict is revealed through a series of temptation presented by four tempters they try to persuade him to compromise with the king for his safety wealth and power but becket resists right so now that he has come back from the exile he knows that the king is going to send someone to kill him and so does the priest they come and then they tell him that your life is in danger and also he knows that he holds so much power because everyone loves him if he wants he can actually throw the politicians down he can throw the king down he can do whatever he wants because he is that powerful so he is just thinking what should he do now what is the step that he should take so these are the four tempters they will come to him one by one first one is about his safety second one about the wealth third is about the power and finally the fourth one is where they are talking about sacrificing himself okay so these four tempters are the symbolic figures who represent various temptations faced by thomas becket the archbishop of canterbury they appear to becket as he contemplates the implication of his return to england and the power struggle between the church and the state Each tempter offers Becket a different allure, trying to persuade him to compromise his principles and yield to the king's authority for personal gain. Okay, so now we will get to each temptation one by one. So the first tempter, this is the temptation of physical comfort and safety. The first tempter represents the temptation of physical comfort and safety. He urges Becket to prioritize his own well-being and security over his loyalty to the church. The tempter suggests that if Becket agrees to cooperate with the King Henry and supports the king's policies, he will be rewarded with riches, lands, and luxurious life. This temptation targets Becket's human instincts for self-preservation and material wealth. Okay, he he though he does not he thinks about it for a while, but then he moves on. He thinks that this is not what I need in my life. He is not the one who needs land and money and this and that. No. So then comes the second temptation. This is the temptation of popularity and admiration. The second tempter embodies the temptation from the people. He urges Becket to act in a way that pleases the public and aligns with their desires. The tempter suggests that if Becket works with the king and maintains a harmonious relationship, he will be loved by the masses. This temptation plays on Becket's desire for acceptance and validation from the people he serves. but he outgrows this as well and then we get the third temptation this is about the power and political influence right he offers becket the chance to rule as a powerful leader both in the church and the state the tempter suggests that if becket compromises and becomes subservient to the king's authority he will have significant political control and be able to shape the kingdom's policy according to his wishes This temptation targets Becket's ambition for authority and control. So you see, gradually these temptations are a kind of taking hay with his inner inner voices. So the first one was just land and money, which is like for people like us, it would be difficult to leave that. But it was easy for him to leave this because he was a saint, he was the archbishop, he had a deep of faith, he had some other motives in his life. So then, the second one is he he would be loved by people. This is not about money or material anymore, but this is about the people would be loving him and he can do better things for them. And he overcame this as well. Then the third one was even more tempting because this one was not even about what he will get, but what he can do for others. He can create better policies. He can give these people a better environment. he can give them maybe more money or he can help the poor and all of this because he will have that power to bring that change 
So this is even more tempting because if this were you or this were me, I would think that, oh, okay, at least I can do something for others, which means that this won't be a selfish decision, but rather something which I'd be doing for others. So see, it's gradually getting more and more tempting. But he outdo the third one, and then we'll see what happens in the fourth temptation. This temptation of martyrdom and spiritual glory. So because he is such a high power, because he is on a high level, this temptation embodies his spiritual glory. He presents the idea that if Beckett resists the king's demands and refuses to compromise, he will become a martyr revered by the church and the people for his unwavering faith and sacrifice. The tempter suggests that martyrdom will grant Beckett eternal spiritual glory and a lasting legacy. This temptation plays on Beckett's spiritual devotion and his desire to leave a significant impact on history. So you see, this last one, it's not just about what he will do now. Like, of course, he will be dead, but I don't think he cares about dying. But then everyone will remember him forever, for his devotion, for his spiritualism, and he will leave an impact on society for hundreds and hundreds of years, which eventually happened because if you see, this happened in somewhere around 1100, and we are reading about it in 2023 now. So definitely... It did happen, but let's see how it happened. Throughout the play, Beckett grapples with these temptations, wrestling with his personal desires and his commitment to the principles of church. Ultimately, he chooses martyrdom, standing firm in his conviction and remaining loyal to the church, in the, to the church independence from political interference. The four tempters serve as powerful allegorical figures, illustrating the internal conflict between earthly desires and spiritual devotions and highlighting the complexity of human nature and moral choices. This was all in Act 2, Scene 1. Okay, finally in Scene 2, we see Bucket's sentries warn him of the imminent danger posed by the king's knights who determined to eliminate him. Beckett reaffirms his commitment to the church and martyrdom. So he chose to to die in a way to die because he knows that those centuries will come and they will kill him. So we move to Act 3. The priest, fearing for Beckett's safety, attempt to persuade him to flee, but Beckett refuses and he prepares himself for his fate. He delivers a sermon to the congregation, urging them to stand strong against the operation and remain faithful to God. Then the four knights they act on the king's order, they confront Beckett in the cathedral, they demand he submits to the king's authority, but Beckett stands his ground and he refuses to compromise. With this, we come to Act 4, where the four knights assassinate Beckett inside the cathedral. Despite his death, Beckett's spirit remains present and the chorus reflects on the significance of his martyrdom. The Archbishop of York delivers a sermon condemning the murder and calling for justice. He predicts that Beckett's martyrdom will have lasting consequences for the kingdom. Finally, in Act 5, we see the chorus of women mourns Beckett's death and reflects on the spiritual significance of his martyrdom. They pray for the strength to endure the trials ahead, and the knights responsible for the murder confess their action to the audience, revealing their motivation and the consequences of it. See, the fourth reason, the fourth temptation was the greatest one because he wanted to, like, he was okay with dying. So he did not mind dying, and he actually did die. But he did not die for martyrdom. He did not die so that his name would be in the history for hundreds and hundreds of years. That was not the reason. So that's why he's saying that the last one is the most tempting because he would be doing the right thing, but the reason would be wrong, right? If he died to have his name in the history, that would have been the wrong reason. He did die, but he died for the reason that he was so faithful to church. He would not bow down to the king or he would not uh, be a part of politics because that is not to the principles of his or, the, or his church, right? Their actions. With this, with the death of Thomas Beckett, this all ends, the play ends. You see, it, this play has a very serious note and throughout the drama, it's all about, like, there's no comic relief, nothing. It's just a serious play and it has to be taken like that. Now, as I've mentioned, this is a very important play, so I have about 15 quotes from this play, and I will also put uh, the names of the characters who actually gave these quotes, because I feel that this is kind of crucial play, if you are attempting a So, let's just start with the first one. This is from Thomas Beckett. 
peace and let the deep gulf swallow up this and all my other sins from worldly cunning and the fierce ordeal from the fierce madness of this worldly world the cries of men and clash of fratricidal war deliver me the second and third and the fourth one are also from thomas becket the second one is and all of the pleasant vices are but seeds which in the fruitful season of the maturing sun give birth to generations of new sins the third one is the last temptation is the greatest treasure to do the right deed for the wrong reason uh, we will come to the fifth quote which we have i have smelt them the death like odor coming from his breath this is the first priest when he is telling that he is scared that some uh, somehow some aspect is in danger so then we have some aspect saying we do not wish anything done which is not in accordance with the honor of the glory of god the seventh one is i do not fear them i have the strength of the church behind me again thomas beckett then the eighth one is from the fourth tempter when the will is not free the imagination is never unencumbered then the chorus says and by the door and by the door also the chorus says in the beginning is my end and the end is my beginning and the chorus says christ is the king christ will send christ again christ is in bed and then we have thomas beckett who said we have not reached conclusion but have only come to the round beginning and then the last three is the first one is from the first tempter what do you think is the most important the fact or the meaning the second tempter beckett's the man the only man to hold his place against the king and finally we have thomas beckett who says i the man who was born to betray so these quotes they encapsulate the central themes of the play including the struggle between the church and the state the temptation faced by beckett's the conflict between spiritual ideals and earthly desires and the ultimate choice of martyr um so i hope this play was finally clear to you and i hope that you have enjoyed the play i know it is on a serious note but i hope that you did enjoy it. 